Sports end for all of us. Some of us are capable of finding our next passion very easily, while others struggle to find their identity in life after sport. The work Cletus Coffee is doing to assist that transition is phenomenal. He is a former professional athlete who has used the wisdom from his journey to help others around the country utilize their athlete mindset in their next adventure. He is the host of the Recovering Athlete podcast, keynote speaker, coach, and a consultant. This podcast is a must tune in for athletes at any stage in their career, and I hope you guys enjoy. So joining me today is Cletus Coffey, a mutual friend through uh, Jeremy Taiwo. was able to, to change his passion from sports into motivational speaking. Uh, he has a podcast called The Recovering Athlete, uh, and just been able to tune into some things that, you know, obviously I've experienced as I'm transitioning from, you know, playing college basketball, but also, you know, a lot of people who, who find that transition really hard. Um, so really appreciate you coming in today, man. Hey, first of all, much props to you for <laughs> taking this big journey, this launch, and doing this. I love your your energy behind it, your mission behind it. Uh, just the, the the flow is so important. Yeah, and, you know, you just get in your own flow and, yeah. and put it out there is is huge. So I'm uh, I'm proud to to be here and very humbled to for the opportunity because I know this is this is a, a really cool thing you're doing. So yeah, I nice appreciate work. it, man. I hope yeah. I hope guys like you can. You know, enlighten, enlighten guys like me and just keep tuning into it. So I appreciate it, man. You've had a quite the interesting journey, you know, being a professional athlete. A lot of, a lot of people dream of doing that. Uh, but, you know, just being able to talk to you on the phone and before we film this, you've learned so much from that journey and been able to take it into different passions and helping other people. Um, just take me through your journey in sports, uh, starting from a little kid and why that passion developed in the first place and, and how you ended up taking it to a professional level. You, you know, so I appreciate you, the opportunity to, to share my story because it's yeah. it's uh, it's a story that I know a lot of athletes can resonate with, yeah. and primarily because when I finished my career, I looked around and I thought, who, who else is going through what I'm I'm going through? Yeah. And it's easy to look at the TV and and you see guys who used to be in the NBA or in the NFL that are, that are now announcers or pitchmen for advertisements and. And yet, or you, you see the, the, the guys and the girls who are maybe in trouble with the law or finances. It's just the news loves to promote those things. But where's that, where's that average guy like me that maybe only played through high school or college or got a little cup of coffee in the pros and, and yet has got a whole life to live? And where's that story? I appreciate the opportunity to share it because I, I struggled for a lot of years trying to find out other people like me. And hence the reason why I started the Recovering Athlete, because I realized that there are other athletes like me who started at four and five years old. Mm-hmm. For me, it was soccer, soccer and gymnastics. Like that was my first entry point. And then it was every sport, every season, basketball, baseball, football, soccer, track and field. It just, you know, swimming, you just threw it in front of me and I did it. And it was always another sport, another season. It just continued on. And when I was 12 years old, see my, my father throughout, you know, until I was 12, he, he was an alcoholic and really wasn't fully present. Uh, physically, oftentimes he was there, uh, but his, he, he didn't have a presence in my life, mm. uh, with the exception of sports, right? He would come and support me, but he was generally uh, the loud guy in the stands, you know, screaming and hooting and hollering and getting kicked out of basketball games, those type of things. Uh, thankfully, at, at 12 years old, he chose to go seek help. Uh, and I'm super grateful to, to say that he's 32 years sober. Wow. I am so proud of him. But when at 12 years old, really prime years, you know, my dad went away and had to go take care of himself. Mm-hmm. And as growing up in a single house, parent household with, with two other, other sisters, sports was my outlet. There was a lot of pain in there in, in not having a father figure. There was a lot of pain in what my mother was going through and needed an outlet. So I just gravitated towards, towards sport. So I really wasn't really highly recruited out of, uh, out of high school. You know, I was fortunate enough to go to California state track and field meet three years in a row. So I, the track and field is kind of my pedigree and that's where I was kind of leaning towards, but football, I started to get a taste. I I like this. I want more of this, but no one was really looking at me. And so I found a little division three school in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> I don't know, Oregon sounds cool, like let's go. And so I went up to Lewis and Clark College in Portland, played football, ran track there. And as I was approaching my senior year, it wasn't like, 
I was looking for internships and preparing for uh, a career. In my head, I was still that four and five year old who had pictures of Michael Jordan and Carl Lewis and Walter Payton on my walls. I wanted to be an Olympian, a professional athlete. I didn't care. Like that's where my head was. And my mother, bless her heart, was super encouraging. Like, let's go. Mm -hmm. Let's help you reach your goals. Not realizing that the amount of people that can actually accomplish that are very, very, very small. Right? And, but I just, it wasn't in my head. So my senior year in college, I went and did, prior to my senior year, I went and did an internship. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, North Bay, Santa Rosa, California. So I went and did an internship with ABC Sports in San Francisco. And so, so this was, I'm going to date myself. This was pre-YouTube. <laughs> so I'd show up and have to cut tape of the A's and the, and the Giants and the, and the 49ers and the Raiders. And Mike Schumann, a former 49er, was one of the, the anchors for a sports station in San Francisco. He says, hey, let's go to the Raiders game. We're going to go watch them preseason. They're playing the Seahawks. And about halfway through the, the third quarter, he says, let's go down on the sideline. So we go down the sideline, the Raiders sideline, and we're kind of watching the game. And all of a sudden, it hit me. Because I look out on the field and I see myself. Hmm. Because the Seahawks have picked up a free agent quarterback named John Kitna. <laughs> John Kitna, I had just played against <laughs> the two previous years. They were in our conference. And I'm going, I think I broke up some passes from John Kitna. <laughs> He's out there playing for the Seahawks. I can do that too. And that started just the avalanche of just I got to do this. I got to be out there too. I know I can do it. So I had a really good senior year in college. And from that point on, I just, I cut my tapes. I put it together and I had to snail mail. <laughs> <laughs> this is again, kind of dating myself, kind of pre early internet where you couldn't just, I was having to search for just clubs. So I was looking mm. up all NFL clubs, Canadian football league, arena football league. Uh, those were kind of three main ones. And so I nail, I, I mail the tape to every single one of them. I got three callbacks, <laughs> three. Well, what? This is great. Uh, but again, thinking like, oh, this is easy. I got this. Yeah. End up signing with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders Canadian Football League, uh, and then also with what what was called the Memphis Pharaohs of the Arena Football League. They actually ended up moving to Portland, ironically. <laughs> and so I signed with them. So I had, each team had my rights. Went up to Canada, and uh, ultimately got cut. First time I had felt failure as an athlete. Boom. I went to Canada with every last possession I had, like three bags. That was it. And thinking like, I'm just going to move in. Like, I'm here. Like, mm -hmm. let's do this. What's my career going to, how long is it going to last? You know? Not realizing that, oh yeah, it's a business. And we got to get down and, and I got to make some money. And I got to pave a way in a, in a league where they only take, I think at the time it was about 17, what they call nationals non-Canadians. So I'm competing with generally three, three of the quarterbacks are, two or three of the quarterbacks are, are Americans. Mm -hmm. So now we're down on like 14, 15 of us trying to make this roster. It was, I didn't make it. I get cut and it wasn't like, hey, here's how, you know, this is what you did. It, it was, if you've ever seen the hard knocks on yeah. HBO, like that was it. Uh, hey, here's your plane tickets home. <laughs> where do you want to go? I don't know. I haven't been home in five, six years. Yeah. I don't know where home is. <laughs> So I just, I ended up um, saying, send me to Portland because that's where the other team had my rights. Went to Portland, ended up playing four years in the Arena Football League, had a great time. Got to play in Madison Square Gardens and the Staples Center, and just I, these iconic venues and just had an incredible professional football experience. And ultimately I ended up breaking my leg, which is where, you know, as athletes, it ends generally before we want it to, where we think it's going to end. And I was kind of preparing for the next steps for me, which was NFL Europe. That was my gateway to try to make it to the league. So I was trying to work in the NFL Europe. I break my leg. That was it. Mm. My window was, was shot. Then started a decade of struggle. Here I am at the almost the pinnacle of my career. We're on ESPN. Families are calling me, family members, friends, going, hey, how was the game? Or I saw you on TV or all this things and and I'm at the the height of my career and all of a sudden I don't I don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. What's my next step? Who the hell am I? Yeah. I don't know. And so I struggled mightily in that trans in that transition because it ended like overnight. Broke my leg, 
actually came back and compete, compl- um, played in the last like, three or four games. Got all the pins and screws and out of my leg. And then now what? Hmm. I don't know. And that started this a good decade of odds and end jobs having struggling with identity it's funny my son is is in middle school and he was really hyped about his yearbook right all his buddies are signing it you know <laughs> and I thought do I, do I have my yearbook and and so I dug through my stuff and I found my junior high my eighth grade yearbook and I you know obviously haven't seen that in a long time and he's super excited. So we're looking through it. And there was probably 10, 11, 12 posts, uh, uh, friends writing in my yearbook saying, see you in the NBA. Hmm. I can't, you know, even teachers. Hey, I'd love to have your autograph now because I can't wait to say I, I knew you way back when. I'm a 13-year-old kid yeah. with adults and friends all telling me, can't wait to see you in the league. It was in my head. It was a foregone conclusion. I was going to be a professional athlete. Mm-hmm. There was no plan B. There was no like preparing for anything else. And it sounds counterintuitive. Like, well, you sure? I mean, looking back, I probably should have had a plan B, but it was just all that or bust. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I know I'm not alone in thinking that because I go and talk to colleges. Well, first, I talk to high school. How many of you want to play college sports? Ninety percent of the hands mm-hmm. go up. I go and talk to professional athletes, or sorry, collegiate athletes, and it doesn't matter what level, division one, two, three, how many of you would you like to play professionally? 90% of the hands go up. It hasn't changed. Right? We are still in this, it's, it's harder today, I would think, for college athletes with social media and the followers and the, and the access to get your game film and get seen, you know, on YouTube or, or Instagram, or what have you. So. There's a, there's a draw there. There's a lure to that world when, in fact, very, very small fraction. I'm very fortunate to have gotten as far as I did. Yeah. I mean, there's there's so much to unpack in what you just described. I mean, really appreciate the honesty there. Um, I think one thing I would like to hear is, you know, you said after your career ended, it's like that's when you started to learn your identity um, and maybe just take us into – what could have been the process during your playing career where what what do you wish you would have known so you could prepare yourself to know who you were earlier and maybe if that would have assisted your playing style maybe assisted how well you could have played because a lot of being in flow is to have that you know autonomy and i think a lot of flow is knowing yourself and being able to you know relax your thoughts relax your being and, and not get too caught up in the highs and lows and be anxious for the you know the success or or trying to perform so if you could go back or maybe teach other, other players who are going through it right now and haven't you know, finished their playing careers, what would be some lessons or you know, advice you'd, you'd have for them to you know, tap into that self-awareness and that self-truth um, at a younger age? Okay, to help you and any athlete or former athlete listening to this, the number one thing we need to do is break up with the idea that we're athletes. Mm. I'm not an athlete. It's what I did. It's just, I just happen to play sports. And yet we get, I, we identify with ourselves as athletes from four or five years old. And that's just what we're taught. And that's what people think of you, right? They come to us and go, hey, how was the game last night? Or how many points did you score? Mm. You know, where, what's the next step? And then we get to beyond high school or beyond college and people are excited. Hey man, you were the top guy in, in high school or in our league, what's next? Where are you going? And now we're embarrassed to say, uh, I'm not playing anymore. <laughs> or we get to college and no, I didn't make it into the pros. Or we get to be professional and it's, oh no, I'm not playing anymore. Yeah, because we get so caught up in that identity that we're athletes when we're not. Hmm. And so the one thing that I would share with anybody still playing sport is to break up with the identity of being an athlete, all identities. Because it we, we get labels. So for example, once we get you know out of sport, we get labeled as coach or manager or mom or dad, these identities. And we get so caught up into them. And identity is really the ego's like uh, sugar or steroid. Like it just it just flourishes, it thrives the ego with identity. And as long as we can break up with the identity, we can help push aside our ego. 
you know, I talk on my podcast, I talk with former Olympians who say, you know, gosh, when I, or professional athletes, you know, when, when I'm done playing, they talk about the embarrassment when people say, oh, what's your next step? Mm-hmm. Now what are you doing? And they say, I, I don't know. And they're, they're embarrassed to say they don't know because they've been this thing way up here for so long and now they're not it. So we have to break up with the, re, with the fact that we're not athletes. We're us. Right? You're Will. I'm Cletus. Mm-hmm. That's who I am. I just happen to play sports. And so athletes get caught up in this idea that that's who we are and that's what we identify with when, in fact, we have to start to understand and learn about us. Self-awareness, baby. That's yeah. where we got to go. Mm-hmm. What am I good at? Uh, what am I not good at? What are my challenges? What do other people say about me? You know, like, Will, when people are, what do people come to you with questions about in life? All right, what, what does the marketplace say about you? And I just, I wish I had gone through that process when I was an athlete so that when I rolled out of it, I would have been more familiar with myself, mm-hmm. what I was capable of, where I needed support, where I needed mentorship, what the marketplace said about me. And if we just stop and listen, we, we, we'll get it from, from the marketplace, from our friends, our families. They'll come to us and go, hey, tell me about how to lift weights or tell me about how to start a business or how to be a good parent. You know, they'll ask us because it intrinsically comes out of us mm. what we're good at. And so we have to listen to that. So breaking up with identity and doing a ton of self-awareness work. Who am I? What am I good at? What do I align with? What excites me beyond sport? What gets me excited? It could be music. It could be whatever. Art. It could be meditation. I I don't, you know, as long as we take the time to to self-reflect and gain that awareness, man, that's, that's the, that is the key. That's the number one key. Yeah. I'd share. I mean, that's beautiful, man. I I think that's, that's huge. And I, that's been my biggest process is understanding who I am. Even when I, my last year playing, that was the big struggle. You know, I started a meditation practice to really see my thoughts, see who I was, where was I struggling. And a lot of times I didn't want to accept that. I just kind of want to push it away. I didn't really want to understand it. Where were those coming from? Why was that coming up? And as I am more aware, you know, I can piece it back to when I was a little kid and, and getting those same ideas from people. Oh, he's a basketball player. Like when I was in Spanish class, Every day I'd write, who gay baloncesto? It was like, what'd you do over the weekend? Who gay baloncesto? Which people who don't speak Spanish just played basketball. It was just kind of easy for me. It was just the identity of, of who I was. So I kind of just rode that, you know, as long as I could. Um, but one thing that I really liked that you said is breaking off the identity of who you are from the sport. And another thing for me as I understand flow more and that peak optimal experience is breaking away from that identity that I don't even know what that is if that makes sense, like experiencing it on, you know, an internal level rather than just in my head and knowing what it is on an intellectual level. So when you talk about self-awareness, what are some ways that you've been able to tap into that and not in just an intellectual way where you just, oh, I know this should be good. I know this should be something that I do. I know this is something that I, you know, should know as my identity. But you know, even just saying, hey, I'm not an athlete, a lot of times our emotions will get caught up as if, you know, you did believe that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what are some ways that you process that in a way where it actually resonates and actually you see that as something beneficial? Uh, First and foremost, the challenge that athletes have is that we, for a long time, have been given structure. Mm -hmm. We've been given the plays We've been told what time to be there, what to bring, what to eat, how to train, what reps to do. It has just been been put on a platter for us, some more than others. I totally get it. But we, once we step out of sport, we have to become not just the athlete, but the coach. Mm. We have to set the plays and the strategy, and we have to execute on it, something we're not accustomed to doing. And so it becomes uncomfortable. We we would like for it to be somewhat laid out or someone give us the – the framework so that we can go, we're good at executing. We can set the goals and go knock those suckers down. That's Mm -hmm. the athlete mindset. We know how to do that. We don't necessarily know how to do is how to actually set the strategy. And when things get uncomfortable or we, we, um, we don't have a coach there to say, Oh, Hey, let's, let's adjust. Let's make a halftime adjustment or let's make it a pregame adjustment for the, for the next game. We don't have a coach doing that. We actually have to do that. So athletes, we have to take massive action. Number one, we have to, to take a look at 
uh, you know, adjust, or excuse me, um, analyze the action, and then we have to adjust accordingly. Hmm. So whatever action we take, we have to analyze it. Is this working for me? And, you know, the one thing I, I would highly recommend is, is with this self-awareness work, like what would you do if money was not an issue, time was not an issue, family was not an issue, mom and dad are pressuring you to go be a doctor or an attorney or, you know, whatever. If, if those things were not an issue, what would light you up the same way as running out of the tunnel pregame or the same way as being in the starting blocks? Uh, the, the, whatever your sport is, like what would give you that same, I call it a high. Right? Mm-hmm. What would give you that same high, that same feeling that you once had as an athlete? What turns you on? And for a lot of athletes, oftentimes the cliche thing is, oh, you're going to go be a coach. And for me, I didn't want to be a coach. Primarily coming from the football ranks, I saw a lot of my coaches who were staying up all night dissecting film. I come in the next morning in college and they're sleeping on their, on their, their couch in their office. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, their family lives were, were broken apart because they weren't able to see their kids' games, uh, which created disconnect with their, with their, I didn't want that. And so, not that I didn't like coaching. In fact, I still do it at the high school level uh, and on a, as an assistant basis, but I didn't want to be, a, I didn't want to make that my career. So now what? Right? If I'm going to go outside of sport, and the one thing that I reflect on that I, I really, you know, I don't want to say I have regrets, but the one thing that I would have done differently was I, when I transitioned out of sport, I cut it off completely. Mm-hmm. Like, that's not me anymore. I don't want to be looked at as the jock or the athlete. I want to be taken serious. Like that was my whole thing. And I, I made a mistake. And ultimately, because most at the time, most people want to talk to me about Cletus the athlete, and I wanted to be taken serious as the business person or the entrepreneur or whatever. And I didn't want to be the athlete anymore. I wanted to be something else. Forgetting that, that's part of my. It's part of me. It's part of who I am. Mm. And although I was trying not to identify with with it, I went the complete opposite mm. extreme and tried to pretend like it never happened. And yet, again, that was part of me. And we can't be afraid to take those pieces with us and try to connect the dots with really who we are. So when it comes to the self-awareness, we have to do, we got to do the, the introspect work, right? Look inside of ourselves. What are we good at? What would I do if, if all these things weren't an issue? What gets me excited? And go take a step into that. Mm. Even though there's not a play for it, even though there's not a, a, a workout plan to go do that, go do it. Go try it on because you're going to learn one of two things. One, you love it and <laughs> you made the right choice or, damn it, this is not for me. Mm-hmm. Great. Move on to the next step. And I, in being a perfectionist, and I don't know if this is the athlete in me or just me, I was a perfectionist. And so I get stuck in, for so many years I got stuck in, well, let me try to mold it this way. Let me... Let me make sure I get it right before I actually launch it. Yeah. And I suffered mightily from that. And not it, only in myself. I, you know, I suffered internally going, God, I'm dying because I want to launch this idea, but I'm so stuck in my own head uh, that I'm afraid to take action because it's not perfect. And what if I lose? And what if I fail? And my past has told me that fail, failure is not a good thing. Yeah. You know, I really would encourage anyone who has never been a given permission to f- I'm going to give it to you right now. Will you've got permission to fail. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever gave me permission to fail. Yeah. And actually taught me how to fail. Yeah. That's such an important aspect. Here, here's how you here's what you need to be successful. Uh, in order to succeed, you got to fail. It they go hand in hand. There is no good without the bad. You have got to fail your way to success. And the only way we can learn how to fail is by taking risks, taking a step. Some things that a lot of us athletes were never taught. We were not encouraged to take risks because if we made a mistake, we were on the line running or we're doing wall sits or we were, you know, ripped in front of our teammates because we made a mistake. And thus, we got a little hesitant at actually taking a risk. And so now, man, I talk to athletes all the time. I'm saying, what's up? You're, you're stuck in mediocrity. You're working a job that you don't like. You got a, a, a manager who's yelling at you because you're accustomed to it because you were yelled at by your coaches for so many years. What's the deal? Um, I don't want to. 
it's too late for me. You know, I've got a family, I've got bills to pay. I'm afraid to take a risk. Mm. I'm afraid to do what's uncomfortable. And it's unfortunate. It's been ingrained in us for so long through sport. And hopefully we can change that rhetoric and that philosophy. But as it is right now, a lot of athletes are stuck in that mediocrity. And that's what I'm hoping to do is to rattle their cage and remind them who they are. Yeah. Remind us what we're capable of. Because there's a fire and a drive that you and I both have. I mean, you're, you're, you're still living it. I'm still living it yeah. in some capacity. As, as, a, you know, as a competitive athlete, there's a fire and a drive. And if we don't have a place to put it that turns us on, then that's where the anxiety comes in. The depression comes in. The relationship challenges. The health challenges. I see it all the time. So that's why I want to be able to do it. If you're not doing it already, you know, do that work on yourself first and then try to figure out then, you know, what steps you want to take and go take, go take that massive action. Mm. See what happens. Yeah. No, that's beautiful, man. And, you know, we talked off camera a little bit too is I think maybe one of the problems of, especially as I've transitioned, you know, a little bit out of basketball and don't have that routine schedule is, Oh, I wanted everything to be at college level or professional level right off the bat. So even as I'm starting this podcast or, you know, trying all these different fields that I've gone into. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to a buddy about meditation. And, you know, at the start, I just wanted to be at college level like that. Like I wanted that athlete in me, wanted that perfection out of it off the bat. And I think that might be part of the fear, right, is, is if you go into another field, you kind of start over. You know, when we're little kids and we're playing, you know, we go through a lot of those failures and we're not really aware of it. We're not really conscious of it. And then we get better and better because we love the game. So I think what's beautiful about what you're talking about is don't be afraid to fail, but do it in a place that you're passionate about. Because if you're passionate about it, you love it, you'll go through those trials and you'll get better and better and better. So I think that's some that's some huge wisdom uh, coming from you and definitely something that I'll try to embody uh, moving forward. And, and get this. Let me let me dovetail on this. Yeah. You and I were taught at a very early age that we compete with the person in front of us. We go out to practice every day and to earn a spot in that starting lineup, we're competing against our buddies on the team. And then when we go into the game, we're competing against the other team. Yeah. And for those in sport, are like, yeah, that's, of course, that's what we do. And then what happens is we get out of sport and then we want to be the best right off the bat. And it's because we're competing and we're comparing ourselves to the best meditators in the world. Yeah. To the best podcasters in the world. Because it's ingrained in us that we need to compete with those that are out there. And it, I wasn't until I was in my early 30s when I got absolutely smashed over the head. I saw saw a quote by Alan Page, who's a Hall of Fame defensive end for the Minnesota Vikings. He says, every day out in practice, I lined up not against the person in front of me, but against myself. I needed to get better at what my craft was. I, don't, I didn't care about the person in front of me. And I thought, oh my goodness. How come no one ever taught me this? Yeah. When I lined up in the blocks and the track, it was always, I, my heart was just pounding out of my chest because I was nervous about the person next to me. I was worried about their race. Yeah. Lining up on, on the basketball court, in, on the football field, I was worried about, okay, I need to, get, I need to beat this guy. Versus, what can I do today in this rep to get better than my last rep? What can I do to get better this year than I was last year? But this practice versus last practice, focusing on competing against me. You know, here in Seattle, you, the word compete gets thrown out a lot with Pete Carroll and yeah. the Seahawks. And, you know, if you dive into Pete's work and his philosophy, it's, it's, he's all about competition, but with yourself. Mm-hmm. you got to compete with yourself. And so you're right, man. I have the exact same feelings that you had. I stepped out into entrepreneurship and I wanted to be, I wanted the private jets. I wanted the sweet office space. I wanted all those things that I saw other people having. And so immediately I was screwed because I was trying to compete against them. Not how can I get better today in business than it was yesterday? So we've got to learn to compete against ourselves. And what it does is, When we take our focus off of competition, it bursts creativity. Mm. Now I'm not worried about you, Will. I'm worried about, oh, what can I do differently for myself to get to where I want to be? 
it opens our mind to be creative versus competitive. And anybody who's doing any line of work, sport, business, parenting, whatever, we don't need to be as good of a parent as someone else. Just do you. Hmm. And your creativity will come out once you get the, the competition. You, you clear up space in your, in your mind and for you know, once competition's out of there. Yeah. So creativity versus competition. You have, you have kids now in middle school, and, and obviously social media has become such a big thing in, in our, our generation. And for me, especially growing up, I had it you know, in my main developmental ages, and I felt like that was something that did take a lot of that creativity and that passion to do run my own race like you were talking about. Um, you know, as you utilize these platforms or, or you see other people using these platforms and you know the kind of anxiety and the things that many athletes go through, what would be some words of wisdom or some advice you have in, in that category to, to know that, you know, a lot of people are just posting their highlights, they're just posting the things that they're doing in their life that they want to show. But what what's the correct balance of those external pressures, whether it's, you know, social media, your parents or your coaches or those things that could take us out of our own race? There's a, a, a gentleman by the name of Bunk Mr. Fuller. And if you haven't read any Bucky's work, I'd recommend you pick it up. Uh, it's not the easiest content <laughs> to consume. Uh, he, I mean, the guy was a modern day genius. He was an inventor, business person. He uh, did a ton of you know, modern day genius, right? And... But what I really, I, there was a main concept that I took from him that I applied into my life and I apply into my, my trainings, my teachings, my workshops, my talks. And it's a concept that, that is this. Uh, man's main event is nature's side effect. We're so focused on the money, the prestige, the followers, the likes, the, the respect, the fame. We get so, f- the, the stats, the 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 miles, miles per gallon and, the, and the, the square footage of the house and the, the resume, all we're so focused on that. And nature's like, man, that's a side effect. Mm. Right? Nature's main event is humanity, is you and me. Yeah. Us, growth, generosity, humility, selflessness. Like before there was hustle and grind, those type of terms that term character, it was selflessness and generosity and gratitude. Like those were the true elements of character. So nature's main event is us. And and what nature proves it over and over. If we can focus on you and I, how can I be of service to you? Lead with a giving hand. How can I enrich your life? How can I benefit you without interest of anything in return? How can I enrich your life? The, The things that we put in motion Right? It's like dropping a rock into a, a, lake, a, a puddle or a lake, right? Boom, what happens? You drop it in the middle of the puddle, where the ripples go? Mm. All, to all, it touches all edges. I drop a rock into your and my life, it creates ripples. That's going to touch areas that I don't even foresee even available. So we have to, to lead with a giving hand for the sake of humanity first. How can I be a better human being? How can I create and help? other human beings. Knowing that, if I do that first, the indirect byproduct of that is I'm going to get closer to my goals. Yeah. See, if the reverse were true, if I could go and seek money and seek status and fame and stats and all these things and be a better human being at the same time, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. But it doesn't happen that way. There's a lot of very wealthy athletes out there. We just aren't good human beings. Mm-hmm. So we have to pursue excellence as human beings and leading with a giving hand. How can I enrich your life? How can I be of service? Without asking or expecting anything in return and the byproduct, if I do that enough, the byproduct byproduct of that is nature is going to move me closer to my goals. That's huge, man. I think that, I think that can be applied in so many ways. I've never heard it that way. Nature's side effect. I really like that. Uh, but in so many ways, you know, I noticed, you know, as I was finishing up my career and, you know, when I transferred schools from Eastern Washington to Azusa Pacific, a, a big reason of that was because I felt like a lot of my training was external. I thought a lot of my games were external. I didn't think I loved the game anymore. Um, and I would notice in my workouts that a lot of it was I wasn't really focused mainly on the skill, on the craft. I was mainly worrying about, oh, is this going to get it done in the game? 
Is this going to get it done somewhere else? So I was almost in, in, inhabiting an anxious state while I was practicing. And obviously that's going to come out in games because you're just looking at performance, 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 and you lose the love of that process. And like you said, you focus on that, you're going to get the end result the other way. It's, it's almost paradoxical. I, after doing a little bit of research on, on what you're doing, obviously you, you, you're a motivational speaker. You talk to a lot of people. And as we spoke before, you're, you're trying to push the recovering athlete uh, more on the internet. You're trying to get it out there for athletes and, and build a community of guys who are, you know, athletes in general who can come together and really tune into this inner fire that might be unique to athletes, but do it in a way where they're free and they, and they enjoy the process of whatever it is that they do after they play. So it would, it would be great to hear just, you know, what you're trying to do with that. This doesn't have to be a solo journey, this life after sports. We, we've been part of a tribe from our team or teams that we've been a part of for so long. And then all of a sudden it becomes this, this solo journey. Like, okay, now, now I'm on my own. And yeah, we got our friendships that we made and, and, and so forth, but everyone kind of seems to go their own way. When and yet we have a common bond that links us together. The language of sport, the feeling of sport. And it was, it was, it was hard for me because I, after about 10 years of struggling and kind of putting aside my athletic past, I just, you know, I tried things. I tried rec basketball and flag football and indoor soccer, and they were fun, but it just nothing gave me that feeling, mainly because everyone else took it so serious. Like I wasn't trying to take it that serious. But, and then I found Masters Track and Field. And at the time, I had, in 2007, 2008, I had a financial company. Uh, and if you probably remember, that's when the financial collapse happened. I lost everything, lost it all failure again something I wasn't used to and I had to suffer through being a failure and telling calling people going I lost my business or people to say how's business going I mean utterly embarrassed to say I lost it thinking that it was you know, I was a failure and I wasn't good enough to, to actually hold on to my business during this very catastrophic time being in the financial industry and so I left that and I found masters track and field and I all of a sudden poured everything into that because I felt like myself again. I wasn't that failure. I wasn't the, the business guy who struggled and then you know, lost it. I wasn't the guy who had creditors calling him, looking for their money because I couldn't pay them. I found I was back, baby. And it went to a, a world championship in, in 2010, which was great because I felt alive. The problem was they didn't pay the bills. Mm -hmm. They didn't make any money doing that. It was just a... A side thing, something I could do for fun. It was a hobby. So then I, you know, I was crossing over, going, okay, uh, how do I find that? Let me capture that feeling I just had and channel it into something else that allows me to be successful in life as a human being, as a man, as a father, as a partner. Because my world ultimately collapsed, and I'm going through a divorce and having to start all over. Who am I? And what I realized is that I was on the solo journey, not realizing that there are other brothers and sisters in sport that are out there doing the same thing. Why don't we all come together and help one another through the language of sport, through what we know, because there's a fire and a, and a drive that we have. As I mentioned earlier, if we're not putting it somewhere, it, 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 it wears on us. We start to feel regret and that anxiety and that, that depression. So my whole idea and, and my, the venture that I'm on right now is bringing former athletes together and doing it to help them transition. I don't care if you've been on a sport six months or 40 years. If you're looking to, to find that high and recapture that and put it towards something that A, is going to be able to support you, your family, is going to get you excited, it may not be what, what you want, what you thought it ever would be. But if we can open your mind to the possibility of, hey, what gets you excited? And I talked to, you know, I ran into, um, I was at REI talking to the sales associate there. Yeah. And I said, how do you like working here? She says, REI is great. They take great care of me, but I'm over it. What's the reason you're over it? Well, I've always wanted to start my own business. I'm an avid mountain biker. Great. What's stopping you? I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And they've got great benefits here, right? They use, she's using what they call the athlete alibi. 
Well, if I just had more money, I'd start my business. If I had good benefits, then I could leave REI. We put these alibis in as to why we can't go do that. So bringing a community of, of athletes together help, to help provide content, help them put, put a process around helping them get to where they want to be, helping them unravel and find self-awareness, help them with the, the, the different steps that they can take to get them out of the mediocrity that they're in and to become a, an elite human being in whatever, it could be in relationships, it could be in their business, it could be in their career, it could be in their health. So what I want to do is I'm putting a whole training and putting a whole academy around this, both online and offline. I found the greatest growth when I get together with like-minded thinking people live and in in person, where we can get together and brainstorm and network and help one another. I mean, just you and I here, we got together from two athletes coming together networking and saying how can we be of service yeah so the recovering athlete is growing from just a podcast into online training and as well as on uh, offline mastermind groups networks of former athletes that can come together to help grow reach our goals reach the epitome of, of who we want to be as human beings uh, so that we can be of greater service and make a greater impact in life than we ever did as athletes in sport Wow. So CletusCoffee.com is, is where you can reach me. I'm at Cletus Coffee on all social channels. Uh, and that's how you can get, get to connect with me. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming in and, you know, just offering a lot of openness and honesty. And I really am looking forward to connecting with you later down the line. Hey, man, it's absolutely my pleasure. I'm excited to see where you come. What, yeah. what happens with you on this. Yeah, awesome, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, man. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share with your friends to spread the word. You can follow me on Instagram at Flow Station Podcast and find all the interviews on iTunes, Spotify, and the video version on YouTube. Thanks again and keep flowing.